a badge of honor. Police officers and first responders wear badges to let their communities know they are here to protect and serve. But that's not how it feels today. And the stress of the job is taking its toll, taking lives through suicide and post-traumatic stress injury. A Badge of Honor podcast features the cast of the same name, Sam Horwitz and John Salerno. Sam, John, and the team offer the first responders workshops through their critical incident stress management teams and mental health liaisons to offer state-certified t Cole credit programs that save lives. It's time to smash through the stigma. It's time to heal from your injury, and it's time to back our blue. Welcome to a Badge of Honor podcast. Here are your hosts, Sam Horowitz and John Salerno. Hey, hey, welcome to a Badge of Honor podcast with John and Sam. We are powered by the OBBM Network, and uh, we're coming to you live, man, and we're coming to you as our guest today said. We're coming to you real as can be. There's no fakeness here. There's, there's no shyness here. We are all about the openness. But I do want to bring up one thing, man. I'm looking at the uh, – it's the holiday season, right? And we're yes. coming we're, – we're, we're rolling out of 23 and going into 24. I got to commend all of our um, peer support teams, our organizations that are out there raising awareness and helping the mental health of our first responders and our veterans because the numbers show it. The numbers show it. And let me just share with you uh, real quick. And this is at uh, per Blue Help website. All right. Last year in 2022, at this time, we ended the year with 169 law enforcement suicides. 169. This year, even though it's high, it's at 92. So we are significantly down. Overall, overall, in 2022, there were 216 first responder suicides. And, that, and that's from uh, law enforcement, fire department, EMS, 9-11 uh, communications, the whole bit, 216 this year. And if we stay at this number, it will be, it'll be a godsend. It's 129. We haven't been this low. We haven't been this low since even back to 2017. We were up to 187. Um, our highest year was uh, 255 back in 2019. So keep doing what you're doing to all those organizations, foundations, those peer support groups. Keep pushing it. Keep helping because you're, you are making a huge, huge difference in so many lives across this nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let's let's end the year with no more suicides. Let's get mentally healthy. And Sam, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> It was never thrown to me. It was all you, Jolly, Jolly John. So yeah. we're in the uh, we're in the uh, holiday spirit here. I, I guess we we're, we ended Hanukkah. Now it's all about preparing for Christmas. But uh, John, as you and I have talked about, not only live with our, our participants in our workshops, but also all uh, on social media, that this time of the year, from Thanksgiving to New Year's, uh, has historically been a really tough time. Uh, for first responders, you and I have experienced that, you know, firsthand. We've we've battled. Uh, our journeys are our journeys, and we're so blessed to be here carrying on the message of hope. If there is one thing, if you're hanging by a, a thread, okay, have hope that tomorrow will be better than where you are now. And all you have to do is reach out. And I know that sounds John, you and I say it, it sounds easy. Just reach out because the stigma prevents so many of us from doing that, right? Yep, without a doubt. There's somebody in your life, whether or not you've talked to them yesterday, or maybe it's been like five years, maybe it's a battle buddy, somebody. Maybe it's you, you, you went, in, you're a, a veteran and it was somebody that you serve with to a teacher that made an impact. Think about the people that have made an impact in your life. Pick up that phone or go on to the website. You can visit our website, badgeofhonor.org, and click on a number of our partners and our resources that we are we are in this fight to help you uh, with. And the numbers don't lie. So keep nope. everybody out there that's that's uh, you know really focused on. Um, caring for our first responders and our veterans. Keep doing what you're doing because it's making a difference. And tonight, 
uh, on the podcast, we have one of the leaders from a, an incredible organization. Uh, before you, that before we, you bring him on, before you yeah. bring him on, let me let me just recap on what you said a little bit, because yeah. mental health, right? As first responders, we all know, and this is, this brings up our next guest as well. Before you introduce him, your physical health is just as important as your mental health. Remember yeah. that we goes, put our body. They, like they're intertwined. Yeah. We put our bodies through so much over a, a career, you know, no matter what, what field you're in and stress does a number of things to your body. So our next guest that Sam's about to announce will help you bring this, your mental health and your physical health all together in one. So I'm sorry, Sam, go ahead. That's all right. No worries. Is that you playing the music? <laughs> I had to answer my watch. My watch was ringing. <laughs> oh, we, you know, we'll, we'll technology. We love it. Technology. Christmas music, technology. Um, we have got an incredible guest on. He's got a phenomenal background, and it leads right into what you just said, John. Physical health, mental health, it's all intertwined. So welcome, Mike Connor from Front, Frontline Mobile Health. Welcome to Badge of Honor Podcast. Welcome, yeah, It's Mike. a pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. You bet. Yeah. Now, Mike, we first met at the David Clark uh, Superhero Health Fair, which was put on by uh, the Dallas Police Department, their uh, FOP. Um, amazing. Tons of organizations out there. Our, our, all of our main goal and focus is on was on the first responder, the, the police department, the officers that showed up. I know you guys talked about testing. There were other groups that actually did like on-site blood tests and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Just tell everybody listening and watching uh, about your background and how you got into um, being one of the executive team leads for Frontline Mobile Health. Yeah, so it's a really uh, cool story, right? So I met a guy, uh, my business partner, Russ. Um, we were both military PAs, so physician assistants. Um, and we were transitioning. We we're trying to move up to more responsibility in the military. You have like certain routes you can go. And to me, what sounded appealing was flight medicine. Um, and I've always heard that that's a good route to go. So I, uh, I lobbied for a flight medicine, um, school, school course date out at Fort Rucker, Alabama. And, um, and my business partner obviously did the same thing. Um, we, uh, I wasn't supposed to go, I, I, my course date got delayed. So it was just by chance that I actually ended up becoming his roommate. And, and not only that, but the guy I was supposed to room with, who is a buddy of mine from Afghanistan that we had done a deployment together and some medical training together, he, his orders couldn't get approved in time. So my original roommate was canceled, my original course date. So just like all of these circumstances just kind of pointed me to meet Russ who is an amazing human being in a uh, father of um, father of seven. Um, and I was just inspired by his drive. And so we became friends. He came back to the same brigade. So we were in the same aviation brigade. We we're both backseaters, uh, backseaters being helicopter guys. And, um, you know, one night he calls me up. He's like, Hey, I've got to tell you about this idea I've got. And I said, sure. Uh, he's like, meet me, you know, meet me at this place in, in about 30 minutes. So I go down there and meet him. He says, he's like, I had an interesting dinner with a fire chief. And I kind of told him what, right? Like he's, you know, you, you meet a new human being in a social setting and Hey, what do you do? He's like, Hey, I'm a, I'm a flight surgeon. And I make sure that, you know, pilots are cleared to wiggle sticks, send ordinance down range and make sure backseaters can do all the stuff they've got to do in the backseat. And Russ was like, what do you do? He's like, well, I'm a battalion chief for a fire department that's here that's local. So he kind of explains what we do in our jobs, right? Like it's literally what we do is we make sure that you're taking the right medications so that you don't get downed because it could be a, a, um, some sort of medication that could affect your ability to fly. Uh, if you've got an injury, we make sure that we get you to the right place at the right time. Make sure you have all of your follow-up care so we can reduce the amount of time out of the seat. Um and so he found it intriguing. He said, hey, have you ever thought about doing what you do for the for the army, for the fire service? And uh, and that was the start. Right. So that started with Pflugerville Fire Department, uh, Travis County ESD2. Um, and Russ is telling me all this stuff and I'm getting excited. And, and I said, hey, buddy, like I've got to go to Korea and be the chief of clinical operations for the 2nd Infantry Division. Right. Like I can't I can't play right now. 
but please keep me in mind. So when I retired in 2018, he asked me, I came on board, uh, I started up full time. And then from there, we've just sort of evolved. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of my background. That's how I started out in the military um, in terms of medicine. And then we just kind of expanded and we grew and we started taking care of fire departments. And then a local police department became interested in what we were doing and was very progressive and, lo- and we were in the same town. So we said, hey, like, I don't have an annual physicals requirement, but we've got to get t coal L2s and L3s completed all the time. How would you feel about doing some of that stuff for us? And so we looked at it, and to our surprise, like, you know, the t coal L2 and L3 requirements, like for L2, it says you got to pass a drug test and you must pass a medical exam. But it doesn't discuss the parameters of the medical exam. It just says pass medical exam. So we just used our best clinical judgment and kind of risk stratified according to you know, like what are the things that affect police officers and firefighters, right? Cardiovascular disease, cancer, behavioral health. So that's kind of where we focused. And then over time, we've evolved and we've grown. And uh, we're now we're today to do work in Texas, Colorado, Montana, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, looking at Virginia here pretty soon. Um, and it's just been a blessing. And I love what I do. And I love taking care of uh, public safety professionals. Well, that is uh, amazing, Mike. And just to hear, you know, from where you came to the expansion uh, across the U.S., we we know you're doing great work because, like I said, we we met you guys. And let's get into the specifics of what Frontline Mobile Health offers. And we're going to do that right after our first break. We'll be right back, everybody. Move freely, America, without medical restrictions or penalty. Without medical freedom legislation in place, our rights and freedoms are one vote away from being dissolved. Move freely, America, with one voice, without fear of retribution, achieving a common goal, medical freedom. We the people make our voices heard by connecting with state legislators and engaging a constitutionally compliant medical bill of rights for all citizens. Individually, change is improbable, but as an aggregate, attainable. It's time to act with one voice. My voice. And my voice. And my voice. And my voice. To protect our freedom, creating one voice that cannot be ignored. This requires your voice, too. Move Freely America. Go to movefreelyamerica.org to find a chapter near you. Plug in, donate, and help our legislators defend our God-given rights under the Constitution. Move Freely America. My voice. And my voice. And together with your voice, we're one voice that cannot be ignored. Donate today. Movefreelyamerica.org. Hey, welcome back to a Bad Jamana podcast with John and Sam. Having a little problems with my lips uh, with our uh, special guest, Mike Connor with uh, Frontline Mobile Health. You know, before we uh, broke for commercial, we get a little background on uh, Mike as he's a PA, he's a, he's a veteran, and um, how he came about bringing Frontline Mobile Health together. And Mike, before you answer the question uh, that Sam had, I want to I want to let our audience know that as first responders and even men and I'm not going to call out any women because you guys are usually good at this. Men suck. Men really suck at this in taking care of themselves. We don't like to go see a doctor and the, and you know because they don't know what we've been through and you know it's like anything else. But to be able to go to a doctor who's been there, a veteran, first responder who is who's knows what to look for. The comfort level goes through the roof, man. You are so comfortable and you feel secure in sharing with him and them and his whole team. So, yeah, Sam, I just want to know, let you know that we suck as men and first responders are getting mental, uh, getting physical health. And this is where uh, Frontline Mobile comes into play. Yeah, it's um, I I I won't say I I'm not going to disagree with that. I certainly have had my experiences, you know, telling folks, hey, you might want to go to the doctor, and I I don't know. I think women are better at it, much better. I'll take your I'll take your word for it. I think we have to do a poll. I don't know, maybe not. But let's get into what you just said, John. The importance of going to somebody that gets us right? They can understand yep. if you and I go to Mike and say, hey, we're, we're both 9-11 first responders. We have been exposed to all the toxins that occurred not only that day, but that were in the air uh, for months beyond. Mike and his team uh, get that. So Mike, let's get into exactly what uh, it looks like at Frontline Mobile Health and the services 
that you all offer. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I will. I would like to make a quick comment on um, on on what John was talking about in terms of uh, uh, men suck at taking care of themselves. Like that's the absolute truth, right? Um, I think, uh, and you know, not being misogynistic or um, anything like that, but like women have like routine medical exams that need to occur or should be occurring on a routine basis, and if they have access to care or the means to get those things, they're generally pretty compliant with that sort of stuff. Dudes man, like we ain't we doing it nothing, man. Like, you know, like I can't tell you how many, you know, 30, 40 plus year old, you know, male firefighter and police officers that I have a conversation with that say like, I'll say like, Hey, I need you to follow up with your primary care. Let's get these things addressed immediately so that we can get on the path to righteousness. And they just go, well, Hey, I don't have one. Can you be mine? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, I can't, right? Like we 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 contract with uh, a lot of these agencies, and we we don't end up do we end up doing providing a screening service and not a patient provider relationship. Uh, we're looking at actually expanding into that, just because we've had an overwhelming um, amount of support and endorsement for doing stuff like that. Um, but to transition back into what the question was, which was, hey, what is it that Frontline does, right? So. Uh, we firmly believe that health is dependent upon really three things, right? And that's your that's your uh, your mental health, your physical health, and your operational health. What do you mean by operational health? Well, um, if you're looking at a person who is working a 2448, and like every other 2448 shift they're on, they're pulling a swap or they're doing OT, uh, they're not really getting the rest, and they're probably not taking care of themselves the way that they are. They're kind of chasing the dollar bills, or they're they're overcoming short staffing issues within the organization, right? So that's poor operational health. So that's what we look at. Pre-arrival questionnaires that we send out to all of our folks, ask them about like secondary employment, because you know you show me a uh, a firefighter on a 4896 or a 2448 uh, who doesn't have a side gig, and I'll show you um, you know a unicorn. Right. Yeah. A lot of those guys all have uh, side gigs and we acknowledge this. Right. That's the cost of living. And then, you know, for being totally frank, public safety professionals really aren't compensated to the level that they probably should be. Uh, but that's a sidebar discussion. Um, and then uh, so we you know, we have these pre-arrival questionnaires. We do uh, behavioral health screening. So we're looking at different dimensions of behavioral health, you know, sleep, anxiety, depression, alcohol use. Uh, stress, secondary stress, compassion fatigue, which is really big, burnout, um, social support, which is a red flag indicator in some cases. Uh, for the physical health stuff uh, uh, or the medical health, as, as most people refer to, we do uh, something called a cardiopulmonary pulmonary exercise test, uh, which is a very sophisticated stress test where you're hooked up to EKG leads and we're gathering EKGs as you're performing on the bike. And then we're also doing breath by breath gas analysis. The importance of that breath by breath gas analysis is that sometimes some of the dysfunction that occurs during that test uh, precedes actual um, uh, things that you can see on an EKG, but you can correlate to labs and history. Uh, a good example is a, a firefighter we had in a, a large department who had a concerning CPET uh, when compared from the previous year. Uh, we strongly encouraged him to go to a cardiologist or go to our cardiologist to have things reviewed. Uh, it was, he had a pretty severe blockage and I think it was two or three and ended up getting stents. Um, wow. So, you know, these are the things that we see, right? Um, and then, so after the cardiopulmonary exercise test, we obviously do vision, hearing, uh, we do an in-body analysis, which is like this fancy bioimpedance device that, you know, measures uh, percent body fat and visceral fat that ties into your health as well. Well, I'm not coming in no more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, hey, you know, the way I frame those things for everybody is like, it's a starting point, man. You know, like, yeah. don't, don't don't feel ashamed about know. it. It's a starting point. You've got to have some place that you got to, you got to have some place to start. Yep. Uh, Absolutely. We do chest x-rays, right? Because those are um, good indicators of like what's going on in the heart. How big is the heart silhouette? Uh, is there some lung pathology possibly? You know, I understand that both of you are 9-11, um, uh, you know, involved with the 9-11 efforts. And, you know, you were exposed to a lot of bad things. So serial chest x-rays is definitely a good thing. Uh, and then the last thing we do is our cancer screening ultrasounds. So we start at the thyroid and we work all our way down into the abdominal area. Uh, and then we go down to, uh, you know, we'll do bilateral testicles for men. And then we do um, trans abdominal ovarian scans for women. 
Uh, so we're kind of getting a big picture. We're, we're, we're casting a very wide net to try and find as much as we can, but we're also doing everything above board, right? All of our high risk cardiopulmonary exercise tests are reviewed by a cardiologist. All of our imaging is, um, is interpreted by a board certified radiologist. Um, and, you know, we have exercise physiologists that are performing our tests and then all of our providers are either veterans or associated with the first responder community. So whenever we, I do have that conversation with a, uh, a public safety professional, it's easy for me to kind of understand, right? Like, oh, you're on a 2448. So when's the next time you're on shift? Like how many calls overnight? How often are you getting woken up? What type of exposures have you had this year? Have you had any hazmat calls? How many structure fires were you involved in? If you're a police officer, it's like, hey, did you have any critical calls this year? Did you have any high speed pursuits that you were involved in an accident for? You know, you're walking with a limp. What happened with that? So it's just being observant and aware of what is going on with your patient and then understanding that like some of that stuff ties directly into their employment. I think that's where a lot of um, uh, providers that aren't familiar with occupational demand and don't have our background or our, our collective backgrounds uh, kind of miss things, right? Sure, sure. And sure. and while the the level of service in uh, in such an, an incredible cumulative manner, um, you know, your your name says frontline mobile health. When we come back from our next break, uh, we're gonna ask like, how do you do all this mobile yeah. health? We'll be right back, everybody. Stay tuned. Cool. Interested in starting a podcast or TV show? Worried about what you'll say and how to keep it engaging? think you'd like to be a guest on podcast, radio, or TV shows? Hi, I'm Susan Hamilton, owner and founder of OBBM Network, and I would like to invite you to an OBBM media training to get the tools you need for a relaxed and polished performance you'll be proud to share. Our specialized training techniques include role play, voice training, and everything you need to deliver a confident, clear, and engaging interaction. Go to offbeatbusiness.com. Go to the calendar and register for a training that's convenient for you. Dates available now, 214-714-0495. Hey, welcome back to a Badge of Honor podcast with John and Sam with our special guest, Mike Connor of Frontline Mobile Health. Before we left, we were talking about, um, you know, in the beginning of the show, we're talking about your background. We started talking about what you do uh, for our first responders and, and recapping on how you guys get us, our first responders, better than, uh, and I don't want to put anybody out of the uh, box, but you look for more things than a, a regular physician would look for because you get us. And you said a couple of things prior to us uh, leaving was, and I'm going to j jump on the firefighter aspect, is that firefighters are uh, exposed to so many different carcinogens, right? You know, you could be fighting a, a fire with a couch. It's giving off some different different gases to a yeah. car and the rubber in the car fire and the, the upholstery in the car to a dumpster fire where there's, you know, you don't even know what's in there. So you guys look for certain things that maybe that maybe a regular physician may not focus on because they don't know what your, you know, what your line of duty, you know, what a firefighter is all about, what they go through on a daily basis. So I, I love the fact that you guys stay up to date with all of these um, things within the first responder fill, like we were talking about AFFF, you know, now we're seeing it, but most doc some docs may go, what the hell is AFFF? Yeah. You know, it's a foaming agent. You sure. guys, you guys know what to look for. So for a firefighter to come for you, to you to be screened, you're going to look for signs of what AFFF may have done to his body when a regular physician may not. Correct. Yeah. So that's, that's actually pretty interesting, right? So um, most standard clinicians are bound by insurance and something called clinical practice guidelines. That's the uniqueness of our model, right? Is that like, we can't accept insurance because if we accept insurance, what are we going to be bound by the rules, right? Like um, I'm not a big fan of rules. I am a big, big fan of um, just kind of making stuff happen if we need to make stuff ha happen. You know, so like we should be screening aggressively in the population. We should be doing the things that aren't typical. You know, we should be checking PSAs on firefighters that are under the age of 50. Right. Like that's not that's not that's not normal for gen pop. Right. Because typically we start looking for prostate problems after the age of 50. But, you know, whenever you combine the risk factors of the exposures and then, and then you know, the sleep disorder, you know, that's the other thing, too, that we don't talk about. Right. Is like all the sleep disorder that occurs 
within the uh, uh, the public safety professionals. It's not just firefighters. I mean, think about the cops that are working, you know, you know, those late night shifts and they're on a reverse shift. You know, I got a buddy that works for APD and he was telling me, he's like, yeah, like every month, like they switch us out from days to nights. And oh, I'm like, I thought oh they did away God, with that. that is That's just brutal. horrible for your circadian rhythm. Like you're never yeah. a chance to recover. Yeah. And, and so it's just one of those things that you have to pay special attention to. And, 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 you know, all of those things have downstream effects, right? Like if, if your sleep, you know, we found in a, in, in one particular uh, uh, subset of the population, we found that like, if you had a clinically significant impairment in sleep, you were 50, you're greater than 50% more likely to have an impairment in some other facet of behavioral health, right? So alcohol abuse, anxiety, depression, social support, something, right? Just something. But if, and, but sleep was the crux of it all. And, and what do we do to our first responders? We flip their schedules around or, 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 up. Right? or the tone's going off at one o'clock for a lift assist, right? Or the tone's going off at, you know, three o'clock for a battery replacement at someone's home, something, right? Um, yeah. That kind of stuff happens. Yeah. So uh, we started talking about with all the services that you offered, you answered my next question in terms of not being bound by insurance. So let's talk about how you do all this in a mobile fashion. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, uh, you know, um, one of the things that I'm especially proud of, of uh, Frontline is that <clears throat> we hire the right people, right? Like we hire culture. We don't necessarily focus on competence initially. It's important to be you know, have the culture and have the competency, but we favor culture a whole lot more, right? And part of the culture is just that we all say it within the organization, you got to be a good dude to work at Frontline, right? And and you and, and John both know, like, but if I say like, yeah, he's a good dude, like you guys know, right? Like, yeah, no, that's a guy that you can call on, right? right. So that's kind of what we focus on. But what we do is we take up all of our sensitive equipment, we pack it into tough boxes, storage boxes, um, and we load it in the back of a trailer. We drive it out to whatever organization we're going to set up at. Uh, we usually do a, uh, something, you know, we, um, a, uh, uh, a, uh, a pre-deployment site survey that something carried over from the military, right? So if you were to go down range to Iraq or Afghanistan, usually you'd be, if you're in a leadership role, you'd, you'd move out as part of the PDSS, the pre-deployment site survey to kind of get a lay of the land, work with the staff that's there currently take the information and intel back, then bring it back to your folks in the rear and kind of let them know like, hey, this is this is our AOR. It's going to be our area of responsibility. This is how we're going to be set up. This is how we're going to employ our assets. Well, we do the same thing whenever we uh, we gain a new customer. So if, if we can't do a live PDSS for an organization, we'll do a virtual PDSS. We'll ask them a specific set of questions. We'll have requirements for like Wi-Fi, internet access, um, you know, make sure that, you know, they're not setting us up in their bay um, mm -hmm. because like that's going to mess with equipment and how right. a hearing test done. So we ask for like an appropriate number of rooms and space requirements. Go down there. We set up right usually the day before or the day of testing and then we'll QC equipment and then hit the ground running and then immediately work with all of the shift commanders or BCs or whomever. Um, and we usually have a host who will communicate direct. And, you know, for us, most of the time, like whenever we work with Georgetown or we work with Pflugerville nearby, you know, we'll uh, we'll have a point person who's saying like, hey, you know, engine 24 is on its way out in about 20 minutes. Go ahead and get your next crew ready and ramped up so they can head over this direction. So we try to be very efficient. And we take a very militant approach to it because that's kind of uh, they that's that's what they like. Right. Like they don't want to have people sitting around. Right. Uh, it's efficient. Yeah, it's it's efficiency. One, it's efficiency, uh, but two, it's being respectful of the organization's time whenever we show up. So we just try to over communicate a lot of that stuff. We set up, and uh, and yeah, a lot of our equipment's mobile. You know, I mean, it's not very light, but it's mobile. <laughs> sure, sure. No, um, so oh. is everybody? Does everybody like just get it from the department that you work with? Does everybody get the opportunity to come through, or is it like they just say you? you know, frontline is going to be here on this day. If it's your day off, come on down or don't. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, right? Because the, the larger we've become, the more we're running into this issue of not issue, but like this interesting uh, thing of uh, benefit physicals, right? Mm -hmm. um, mostly of our organizations require physicals, right? So if you sure. look at 1582, Texas is a 1582 state. 
you know, most departments are required to have physicals annually. Um, so it's easy for the fire service guys, the police guys, not so much, right? Like you've got to get a progressive police chief in place. And, you know, if we're being completely honest, usually the biggest fear from all of the firefighters, uh, police officers and uh, public safety that we take care of is like, well, they're just going to like take me off the truck. If they find out if I'm on this medication, something wrong. take me out of the car. If they find out that my cholesterol is, I was like, no, man, like that's, that's not at all what I'm interested in doing. Right. So you think back to what I learned in the military, right? If I, if I lose a war fighter, I lose him, right? It's not like someone from sea shift can pick up that dude's freaking aircraft and wiggle sticks, right? Like my job is to get, is to identify and like our job is to identify an issue, right? That could be of concern, communicate that issue to the, to the patient and let them know like, hey, these are the steps that need to occur to get you right, right? And that depends, right? So some organizations will have a fitness for duty policy and, the, and they will be completely compliant with, you know, the recommendations set forth in 1582. If you're a firefighter, or they'll have a specific set of recommendations for the, for the law enforcement side. If they don't, then they usually just take us for our word. Um, and whenever we find something that's kind of egregious or risky, right, and we use, we kind of put on our, our risk, our risk management hat for that sort of stuff. For the organizations that offer it as a benefit, they don't care, right? They don't care if some guy's like on the verge of a triple buy. I mean, they care, but they don't care, right? So let's go ahead and reframe that. So they don't care to know that that person. And, and, and then it's my job to really over communicate to the guy like, hey, this does not look good. I need you to get this checked out because this could be an issue in the future. But that's how we set it up. That's how we communicate it. And that's how, um, you know, we kind of operate. See, Mike, you, you, you kind of answered the question that I was going to bring up on that without violating any HIPAA laws. Yeah. You know, what is the, you know, because like I said, men suck at going to see their doctors. But how many lives has Frontline Mobile probably saved by finding, predetermining or either pre-diagnosing or finding stuff that could have a, uh, impact a year from now, like the high cholesterol. Someone's way through the roof. They haven't they haven't gone to see the yeah. doctor or had a blood test in uh, three or four years, and finally you find that, and you're able to say, "Hey, we have an issue." You know, Houston, we have a problem, and and that person's lives was saved because of that. I understand how hard it is for first responders to do this, but you know, your life comes first. That you know, front line is pro prolonging your life by these these procedures. You know, yeah. I, I just want to say this Go is ahead. a perfect time to take a break because we're going to end on a cliffhanger. We'll be right back to answer that question. Right. Stay tuned, everybody. Okay. Look, when you need to respond to an aggressive situation to protect yourself, your family, or your property, understanding your firearm and legal position are critical. Officers know your skills are only as good as your commitment to training. So know what you're doing. So when you're in a vulnerable situation, we can count on your response. Whether you're a beginner or a licensed gun carrier, Carry in Texas offers basic firearms training, Texas permitless carry courses, license to carry, and basic 2A courses so you can understand the responsibilities, situational awareness, and learn the technical skill required when you carry your firearm. Go to carryintexas.com to find the right course for you. Join me, former United States Secret Service agent Samantha Horwitz on the range for beginner basics, LTC prep, and range practice. Go to carryintexas.com today. That's carryintexas.com. Hey, welcome back to a Badger Monitor podcast with John and Sam and our guest, Mike Connor with Frontline Mobile Health. When we, uh, the cliffhanger when we left before we broke for a commercial, talking about how uh, Frontline Mobile can save your life by doing these these scans, these these um, physicals, because you may find out something that you were just putting off because you didn't want to go see your primary. And I'm gonna I'm gonna let a little HIPAA out of me real quick, um, because when I got hurt on a job, right? I was I was 32 years old. I got hurt on a job, and I threw two blood clots, right, into my leg. I go to the, I go to the doctor, and they turn around. And they're like, "Well, you're too young to throw blood clots, but." It probably from the injury, you know, went on, went on, went on. And finally, I saw somebody who had some first responder background who ran a test that they would never, ever run in a, a person who's 32 years old. And what they ran was a factor five test. Yeah. A factor five latent deficiency. Yeah. And they found out that 
And now I've had blood tests all my life. I had blood tests before I went on a job, the whole bit. Not a common but test. You, huh? They, they weren't running not a test. Yeah, not, not a, a normal test. test. Yeah. Huh? It's not, not a, a normal common test. test. Now, if this guy didn't run this test, I would have probably been dead by now because I would have probably thrown an aneurysm or, 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 or a clot, another clot. So because of the injury, because of my blood, that factor five, that's why I threw the clot. And it saved my life. I had to retire because of it, because I had to go on blood thinners, but it saved my life. This, these are things where your organization can bring to these men and women who are heroes for us. I mean, yes, it may be job ending. It may, it may have an impact for a little bit, but it will ultimately save your life. Which yeah, it's funny you say that. It's, it's funny you mention that because that's part of our new hire panel, right? So all of our new hire panels get a clotting disorder um, screening that we run wow. because that's like, you know, in the military, that's common, right? Like if you're going to go to like a specialized school, like airborne school, or like you're going to go wiggle sticks in an aircraft, or you're going to go to one of the harder schools the military has to offer. Uh, they want to know like everything is running optimally before you show up to school, because a lot of the times in some of these austere conditions that you're going to be in, they're not going to be able to like have access to the things that you're going to need immediately. So we kind of viewed that with the same lens. And there's some kind of vague uh, description in 1582 new hire requirements, which has recently gone away. They've done away with that. Um, but that talk about like looking for clotting disorder uh, type stuff. I will say to kind of comment on the, you know, the lives that we've that, you know, that frontline has saved. This is going to be a very, un, but everybody at Frontline understands this and understands how we feel about this on the leadership side is that like we don't save lives, right? Like Frontline does not save lives. The individual who takes responsibility for their health, they save their life, right? We create awareness and that awareness creates opportunity for the organ, for that individual and the organization to, um, to kind of make, you know, the appropriate changes that are necessary. You know, like it's, it's, you know, going back to men sucking at taking care of themselves they really should, right? Because that's that's a, that's that's you being responsible for your health, and that's kind of one of the contentions that I've had as a uh, as a healthcare provider here, and then the healthcare provider in the military is that health is an individual responsibility. We need to take that seriously, just like fitness, just like training with your weapon, right? Like if you can't if you can't clear a room uh, appropriately, or you don't know how to pie a room, or you don't know how to do some of the tactical things, line up in a stack you know, what your SOPs are, those types of things, then then you're at risk to the organization. You need to think about things the same way when it comes to your health. Yeah, but you give us that kick in the ass that we understand. Yes. And that, and that yeah. to me, to me, yeah. that's saving lives. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You may not want to say it, but yeah. to me, that's saving lives because not everybody can give us that same kick in the ass. You yeah. kick us in the ass with a nice first response to boot that we understand. We're like, yeah. oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, the way we communicate to to first responders is probably a lot more different than the way we would normally communicate to Gen Pop, uh, right. just because you know they give. I mean, they give it back to us, right? Like you come into a a department or you come into an organization, and they're going to start talking trash to you, and then we start talking trash back. Uh, you know, that's just like that's just part of the good dude mentality, right? But Absolutely. you'll you'll talk to us on a level that we understand. Yep. You know, a, a doctor sometimes will talk. Throw out all these medical talk, terms yeah, and all talk, these yeah, big talk, things. Yeah. For Five dollars. And we're just like, oh, forget that. Yeah. Do yeah. that. And here's your prescription. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talk to you with five dollar words with your back to you, and then kind of look exactly. over and say, hey, you're still at the pharmacy at such and such, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so let me ask, um, because all of these services uh, cost money. You yeah. know, all these scans, the the blood, the blood work, and everything. How are your services paid for? Yeah, so um, every year organizations have, you know, police departments or fire departments have like health and wellness funds, right? Uh, and, you know, they just have to budget appropriately, right? Just like you have an annual budget for your maintenance of your vehicles, just because, you, you know, just like you have an annual budget for your peer support teams, just like you have an annual budget. Uh, you know, for the number of tires you're going to blow out on that ladder truck or on your patrol cars this year um, that gets forecasted. It's the same thing, right? Like we just use the same uh, process. We use we tap into their safety, health and survivability or their health and wellness uh, budget. And that's how um, that's how we do that. We usually engage in conversation about a year out from uh, doing physicals. So that way, all of the things that need to be aligned are aligned. And then um, 
and we put people on the calendar for their preferred time or the time that's available for them. And um, for let's say you're you're in a city and you're set up and there's mm -hmm. you know retired folks or some somebody refers. Yeah. Um, do you, do you do you offer that? To somebody who's maybe not serving that says, hey, so-and-so, my good dude said, you know, you guys yeah. are good dudes and I need to come down here to see you because X, Y, Z. Do you do that? And is it like a cash pay? How is yeah, it? so it would end up being um, pay out of pocket in those types of instances. We have done things with uh, very like some very large organizations have actually offered up money to retirees um, or like set money aside for retirees, right? For people to come in and get physicals. The amount of retirees that actually take them up in that offer is very small. Um, but it's, you know, again, it's like one of those things where, um, you know, if they did show up, we'd obviously treat them like part of the crew and just kind of run them through the process. Well, I think it's important, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to talk about mm -hmm. those of us who have served uh, yep. For more, you know, me and John for well more than a, than a decade, everything that we're are exposed to, we were exposed to, um, our lives have changed, you know, still, still have the stress um, and lots of other things going on. Um, I, when we come back from our next break, I want to talk about the ease in which, you know, you're, you're very welcoming and but how the payment works so that people can yep. take advantage of it. So we'll be right back. Stay tuned, everybody. To the Health Engineer Show, I'm Kurt Bukley, the Health Engineer, right here on the Offbeat. Hi, I'm Larry Cortez. Hi, my name is Susan Hamilton, and you're watching Offbeat. Hi, this is Dorian Milano. Welcome to Big Ideas Small Business, where we will be talking to Terry Arjala. Hey, welcome back to a Badge of Honor podcast with John and Sam, <clears throat> and Mike Connor with Frontline Mobile Health. You know, before we took the break, we we're talking about the services that Frontline Mobile uh, gives to our first responders and our veterans and how um, I know they don't want to say it's saving lives, but how they give us that kick in the ass to really start taking care of ourselves because we do suck at taking care of ourselves. We're great at everything else. We can take down doors. We can put out fires. But when it comes to doing our own personal assessment on our, our bodies, um, you know, we we toss it to the side and we and we go for you know the um the shooting or the or the, the next big fire and we keep putting stuff off you know as we get older we don't want to do that no more but frontline makes it so much easier for us as first responders to really get in there get a good assessment and follow up yeah so is it a, is it a matter of uh, I'll, we'll just use us as an example um if you're in the area we want to come down get the scan is it is it a is it like a, a menu if you will to kind of or how, how yeah so there, there's a number of options right like you know that we could do what we would recommend um and then but it's not necessarily a la carte right so like in some locations organizations are set up to focus on cancer screening one year and then cardiovascular screening the next so they'll alternate right if you alternate like that you're not really going to miss anything crazy i think there's this big fear that like well we're only getting scans every other year you know unless it's like a super aggressive form of cancer which aren't very common um you're not going to miss something in that two-year window right um, so some organizations do that. Some organizations do everything, right? So whenever we set up, they're doing the bike testing, they're doing all of the all of the cancer screening, the chest X-rays, um, and then some organizations they you know they they have more um, uh, uh, fighting they've got to do for their budget. So they kind of do a very watered down physical. We don't have a lot of those, but we do um, we do have those occasionally. But we would just work you into an organization. Right. And then we'd set up some sort of like finance payment through our CFO. Uh, Chris would just send you a bill and then, you know, you just pay the bill at your leisure. Uh, now, with the, with, this, with this, the 9 11 uh, cancer screening, let's just jump on that because me and uh, Sam, Sam, I don't know where you go for your screening. If you go for, or maybe just you go for a screening with your regular doctor. But, you know, like New York has um, an office, a building set up for 9 11 yep. can, uh, cancer screening. We have so many first responders who have moved out of New York who now live in the, this great state of Texas, right? But I don't know if it avails to them. Um, they go to their private doctor for the screening. Do you guys offer that specific type of screening? Uh, a, a cancer screening? 
Well, before like the a non cancer screening with all the um, do you guys? So I'd have them? to I'd have to look and see what that in, what that involves, yeah. right? Like I'm, I'm, you know, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with you know what they do in New York. And yeah, I'm not sure either. Yeah, so I, think I mean, you're we can, much more comprehensive, Mike, with a with a scan. I think mm -hmm. it's much more comprehensive what you okay. guys do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And there's a, there's a whole host of other things you can do too, right? Like you can do something called gallery with Grail, and we've secured pricing um, that is a lot cheaper for uh, public safety professionals. Um, and then you get a one-on-one -on -one, like consult with one of our staff. Uh, gallery testing is an interesting blood test that they do. They use cell-free DNA markers. Um, which is essentially just little snippets of DNA from the tumor cell that breaks off and circulates in your bloodstream. So a lot of the times what they'll do is they'll find things a lot earlier than imaging would because the, you know, if you think about it, I think a tumor cell when it's about a diameter of a centimeter already considered is, is a cluster of about a billion cells. Um, and so long before that billion cells has enough time to be identified, you may start to, um, kind of chip off some cell-free DNA from that tumor cell that's kind of circulating your bloodstream. And so that's kind of the technology behind Gallery and the folks out in Arizona. Um, and so that's like a really, it's it's a really expensive test. I'm not going to lie to you. It's it's around $800. Um, but it's one of those tests where um, if you're anxious about it and you want to know, it's got a really, really good um, uh, nice, very low false positive rate. So it's not, you know, it's not like a PSA where like, you know, if you do a century ride on a bike and you get your PSA drawn the next day, your PSA is going to be through the roof because you've just like punished yourself down there for essentially a hundred miles. Um, so that that's like a false positive, right? So that's a biomarker. This is very specific DNA testing. Um, and they're looking to secure FDA approval for, um, which will really decrease the cost of the test because then it'll, it'll fall under the CMS system. But it's just it also cause a whole host of other problems once that happens. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's you why you're in terms of access and then you got insurance, but that's a whole nother show. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Mike, I mean, like I said, the level of sophistication is huge. And I'm going to put up the website so that everybody can, can see it. If you're listening uh, to this on your favorite podcast app, it's frontlinemobilehealth.com. And everything, Mike, that you're talking about, your website, uh, you know, gives the bios so people can really understand um, the level of treatment that you're giving back to the first responder community. You guys have been there. You've done it. You care. I'll just say it. You you actually truly give a shit. Yeah, uh, that's one us. of our that's our motto, right? That's like one of our that's one of our uh, core values is give a shit. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'm serious. Well, core core one of our core values is give a shit. The other one is like, don't bullshit, right? Like, so when you're talking to a patient, exactly. don't bullshit them. Exactly. Exactly. So if, so if you're, uh, for the higher ups listening, um, or, or anybody in a department, they can go on mm -hmm. or, or pass your information on to, yep. uh, their department higher ups to reach out to you. And then you guys, work out is is it a contract like a formal contract yeah you know it depends on what the organization has like we're, we're considered a professional service so you don't need to go out for a request for pricing sometimes or a bid sometimes whenever you have a professional service we, we're considered you know so like accounting medical and legal are considered professional services so we can we have a professional services agreement or you know you can put in for a you know a bid and then you can solicit us to kind of like answer the bid and then we'll we'll work on it. Obviously, from there, we'll try to meet your intent as best as we can. Um, and then, you know, like if you're just interested in just kind of chatting with me or Russ or Bruce, our sales guy, um, you can just kind of email myself, Mike, at FrontlineMobileHealth.com. Or you can email um, uh, the generic email, which I think is Doc at FrontlineMobileHealth.com, D-O-C doc at frontlinemobilehealth.com. And what that does is it puts in a queue and then we kind of put it up on our our, uh, our radar so that we can kind of answer whatever questions are necessary that you've got. Yeah, you just brought I up a good thing. I was thinking like doc in a box. Do you guys do any uh, like mobile consultations that all brick and mortar? You have to come to your office. Uh, no, so it's all it's so we have two options, right? If you're in the geographic area that one of our offices are in, um, you you like the organization can 
come to our office and schedule appointments. If, um, if you know, like we have to deploy to an area, we're, we're, we're more than capable of um, setting up in, in the organization's footprint to kind of do that stuff. Oh, no, no. I was more on a, uh, talking about like, say a first responder's out there and says, you know, maybe I want to reach out, but I don't know about it. You could do like a, uh, like a video kind of a web, web, uh, based type to of, find uh, out more information. to find out more information or a consultation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So we have videos all over our website, right? Like there's like a FAQ page that we have, we link videos to. If you're interested in setting that up with me, I'm happy to do that. Or, or uh, Bruce, we can definitely do like a, a kind of a Teams based. So we use Teams exclusively because it's just the easiest platform for us to use. So we can set up a Teams call to kind of, you know, go over this stuff. I've, I've done a ton of back briefs. You know, when we get done with physicals, usually what we do is we provide a back brief to our organizations to kind of let them know where their, um, their physical health their medical health and then their behavioral health sits at for the organization. It's all aggregated data. We don't, you know, poke names or we don't poke fun of people. We don't, you know, name people or any of that stuff. I'm too pretty for prison, right? I don't want to violate HIPAA. Um, so I just make sure that we're, we're kind of hitting all those highlights at the end. Uh, but we use teams to do all that stuff. So yeah, we can absolutely set something up like that virtually. Well, that's fantastic. Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight and really going into the nitty gritty of yeah. the amazing services that you guys offer at Frontline Mobile Health. Again, um, if you can follow Frontline Mobile Health on all uh, social media and uh, connect with Mike and, and the rest of the staff. And you also have um, a great connect uh, on your website where people can go. So that's FrontlineMobileHealth.com. Uh, uh, again, Mike, thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. And uh, folks, take advantage of yes. uh, what Mike uh, just put out there. And if you're if you've got a department, and, and John, you and I talk about this, the Chiefs want the best functioning department. You've got to think about your members' health, he physical health, mental health. It's uh, mm -hmm. operational health. It's all one thing. So. Pick up the phone, get on the internet, whatever, however, Google, you've yep. got the direct website and uh, get in touch with Frontline Mobile Health and make an impact for 2024. It's about people. It's not about equipment or things, right? It's always about your people. You know, real quick, uh, before you leave, Mike, you know, to the commanders and the chiefs that, that are putting these budgets together, not only are you keeping your men and uh, women healthy as frontline uh, providers, you could identify certain uh, risk factors within your department here too, as well. So if you see, if instead of having uh, your guys go to eight, 10, 15 different doctors, this, like Mike, you, like you said, you could put down a, a, you know, a graph and say, Hey, listen, I see, uh, you know, 80% is of your first responders are battling from this. You know, it could be as far as that water fountain in, in the, um, your command is toxic and everybody's battling the same thing and you you guys are able to identify. So it identifies the risk factors factors within that department as well. And it helps the chief evaluate. Maybe I got to change tours. Maybe I had to get rid of the uh, swing shifts. Maybe there's there's certain things that can go into it. So it benefits the it benefits the chiefs as well. Yeah, our, our goal our goal is to reduce suffering and then uh, you need to create some awareness for leaders so they can do some policy change whenever it's necessary. Yeah. Awareness is key. That's where it yep. comes from. So thank you again, Mike. Uh, Merry, Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thank you so much again for coming on. Uh, thank you for what you do uh, for our community and, and beyond. Yeah, it was Thanks, an absolute Mike. pleasure. Enjoyed every minute of it. Y'all have a Merry Christmas too and a Happy New Year. Y'all take All care. Right. Take care, Mike. Take care. Well, this, it, it is truly amazing. Um, and, and I will say I, I've gotten, uh, uh, it, 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 it takes, you got to put your fear aside sometimes to really dive into, you know, the exposure that, that we've had. I've gone through my own cancer scare once. Am I the best at following up? No, I think uh, COVID had, uh, you know, changed the entire way that we look at the medical community, some for better, some for worse, whatever your opinion is. Um, and, but if you're a first responder, uh, take responsibility for your health. You deserve it. 
your family deserves it. Your department deserves it. Your community deserves it. Um, yeah. And so go ahead and do that for yourself. And, uh, you know, we have got um, we're winding down um, for, for this year. As always, we say that we are available uh, whenever anybody needs. It's as easy as going to our website and reaching out uh, or again, scroll down and you'll see our partners and our resources. You can click on any of the logos. Boom, you're right on their website in contact with somebody that can answer um, your questions. Leading off 2024, in the end of January, we have got uh, another wellness and resiliency workshop. Again, our major sponsor, Garland Police Department, they are 100% invested and is a reason why that number, John, that you started uh, the show off with is so low um, because they are amazing. Um, we are so blessed to have them uh, as partners in what we do. To find out all of our events that are going on, visit abadgeofhonor.org. Click on events. You can get registered right through the website. Um, gosh, it, you know, I can't believe that we're at, at another year. And and the now more than 250 it's, it's actually over 300 first responders that we have directly worked with and, and impacted. And, I, and I, I don't say that lightly because we get to hear directly from that in the surveys that they give back to us. And um, we thank uh, the leadership out there and the officers out there that are taking their wellness, their mental wellness and resiliency seriously because they want longevity in the department and our guest tonight mike it the physical is goes hand in hand uh with that so don't don't forget about your physical health <clears throat> excuse me as well to all of our first responders out there thank you so much for what you do for answering the call on our worst days god bless every single one of you for all of our veterans, thank you for staying in the fight even now. So it allows John and I to do this show for speaking out for freedom, for our active duty personnel across the globe, keeping our shores safe. Thank you. Um, you know, John and I are, are taking a break these next two weeks, but that doesn't mean we're going bye bye. It means you listening every every week thank you you guys get to vote for these next two weeks on the shows that we're gonna put up um next the following two mondays because it's christmas and new year's <clears throat> so you guys get to vote and we're gonna look at just go to the youtube page linkedin however you watch us and like the videos because i take it i see how many how many people have watched, how many likes it is. And we're going to put that together. We're going to run the top two shows. Makes a difference because it's yes. who's uh, paying attention and who people like out there. So thank you. Um, keep subscribing. Uh, keep liking everything. Follow us on social media at A Badge of Honor and A Badge of Honor Podcast. You can also follow me and John across the social on our personal pages. I'm at the Sam Horwitz. John's at John Salerno. There's a lot going on. Uh, we just wish you a very Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and God bless you all. John, take us home. Man, with the holiday season, all, to all the commanders, sergeants, bosses out there, the best Christmas present that you could give to all of your first responders is get them mentally healthy and keep them that way. Peace. Till next year, everybody. Take care. A Badge of Honor podcast is produced for the OBBM Network podcast and protected under copyright law. For content permissions, please submit your request to abadgeofhonor.com on the content page. For OBBM Network programming information, please call 214-714-0495 today.